with me today is Jim Sorensen. Um, and it's such a privilege. Uh, I've known and watched Jim from afar for a long time, but then we had the privilege of serving together on the Village Capital Board. And I mean, I, I can I can say that I've learned a ton from you uh, uh, in business, but really uh, what I've been personally most impressed with is every time you and I connect, there's a, there's actually a connection on family. Uh, you you ask me how my family's doing, and you are always talking about about your family. And and, and I remember specifically a couple of years ago, at the the Sorensen Impact Summit, uh, we went to a, a really small dinner, and your wife was present, and it was just a really amazing connection. And so I think one of the things that really impresses me is just how oriented you are towards towards your family. And I think it's probably you know with my first question. Um, something that's been profoundly impactful for you over the years, um, specifically probably even as a young person, uh, growing up the son of an entrepreneur. So, so talk to me a little bit about some of those early years and maybe some of the values that, uh, that your father, your mother instilled in you that uh, still kind of ring true today. Yeah. Um, I think my early uh, life, my family, the, the DNA that I have, is a big part of who I am. I think uh, it, it probably is with, with a lot of people. But uh, clearly early on, I came from a big family, I have a, a family of eight children. Um, my parents were um, really struggling um, as, as a new um, generation uh, trying to you know, work their way into the world. My dad um, was um, kind of a rags to riches, ultimately successful entrepreneur, but for many years um, spent his time, you know, basically selling uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, and I had a very close knit relationship with my mother and my and my my siblings, and. And my dad was away for a lot of the, the time, and uh, we had a good relationship with him, too. He was more of the disciplinarian, and my mother was clearly more of the nurturer, so it was a good uh, balance. Um, and I grew up with that kind of combination, which I think was healthy, uh, and a close interaction with, with my siblings. Um, I think the, the thing that really put me on the path where I am today, I think is the combination of what, you know, each of them imparted with me. My, my father was very, um, very business oriented, uh, very entrepreneurial, uh, innovative. Um, he was scrappy looking for opportunities, uh, and, and really built, um, quite a, quite a business, in as an entrepreneur and very successful and he taught me how to work and from a very early age like from eight or nine I, w I was working doing something either in one of the businesses whether it was cleaning up lingerie scraps when he had a lingerie manufacturing business or you know making uh, medical devices on an assembly line uh, and then later on doing work outside the family, um, I'd learned to help to work and what it was like to work. My mother was, I think, the ultimate uh, nurturer. Uh, she was very empathetic. Um, she's the one that you went to when you had, um, you know, the problems and you needed um, the, the empathy and, 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 and the advice um, she loved good causes. She loved people. She loved to serve. Mm. That was my mother. So um, when I look at the, those qualities, and those are both really strong, good qualities, um, I think they're a great backdrop for ultimately my journey into impact investing, um, which began as an entrepreneur, trying to make a business succeed, uh, finding that, um, you know, I needed to make a pivot, um, having the foresight or I guess really the heart to hire a deaf brother-in-law that had a difficulty in finding a job. Um, even though 
conventional sense would say that may not be a market and this job may not pay off. Um, but ultimately, the irony is that at a very difficult time when uh, the, the market has kind of closed for what we developed in the mass market because of the dot-com bubble bur burst at that time, um, to have this deaf brother-in-law come forward with really an idea and a new service uh, that uh, would take really, I think, a, a momentous shift in the company in terms of focus from a mass market to a very underserved, small uh, market of, of, of deaf mm -hmm. and hard of hearing people. Um, and then ultimately to have a tremendous success built around that. Um, you know, I think, first of all, wanting to do that, I think uh, certainly the background that, that I had and um, the use of the technology for the purpose that it was, um, was a part of that early environment, um, of my mother and my father, and then, um, you know, having the entrepreneurial grit to stick it out, make it work, succeed as an entrepreneur, and then have the huge success. I mean, all of those things help to inform, I think, who I am and ultimately where uh, I've gone as it relates to, uh, you know, impact investing. Yeah. Well, it's, in, it's, uh, it's neat that you, you got both of those different things from your parents, you know, like the law from your father, just this disciplinarian, but also the, the strong work ethic and the importance of working hard and figuring it out. But then also on the other side, this, this, this quality of grace and, and empathy. Uh, I think that's a good balance uh, for, for families and for people to, to, to kind of have an equal measure uh, to kind of, what does it look like to, to, to live in, in, uh, in that tension? Um, because life, life is not always as, uh, as easy as it might, uh, as it might seem. So that's really fascinating. Um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about Sorensen Media and so this decision with, with your deaf brother-in-law. And were, were there any moments that, um, that were really, you know, as you were running the, running the business where you thought, um, wow, this might tank on one hand, <laughs> uh, or wow, we actually are onto something here. Um, and, and I think there's probably several, but were there some critical moments where you're like, wow, there's, this is really hard and I don't know if we're going to figure it out, but we're going to try our best. Um, or on the other hand, man, we've, we've really, we've got something special. Well, I, I think there were a lot of moments like that. And a, a lot of times when you had to take the leap of faith or follow your gut or, um, you know, be courageous. We, we were losing a lot of money at that time. It was about a million dollars a month in this business. And so even continuing, um, and, and this was the, the day after uh, we'd had all the term sheets pulled from companies that were interested in investing because that's how precipitous this drop was in the markets. For those that have lived that during that time, you saw companies drop in valuation from, you know, by some as many as 80% in, in valuations. Um, and we had to make a decision. I mean, do we continue? On what basis do we continue? Um, and, you know, it was, I think, providential that that was at that time that my brother-in-law came to me. But it was still a difficult decision because we still needed to redeploy and even though we were going to reduce, um, we had to reduce um, uh, the numbers within the company, uh, we had to redeploy into a whole different, uh, now a, a communication services 24-7, had to be very reliable. We had to figure out how to get a contract because the contracts were all wired to existing telcos, very large companies, AT&T, Hamilton, Sprint, so forth. And then uh, we had to essentially develop a whole new workforce of highly skilled uh, and somewhat mobile uh, American Sign Language interpreters mm. um, and essentially establish call centers across the country with these interpreters because they weren't all in one place. And they, they, it was a skill that um, was scarce uh, to be able to provide this service. Um, it, we didn't know how that was going to work. And initially we partnered with Gallaudet University for our first interpreting center because they had 
great in, interpreters there and also a market. But once we saw that this was a business that was growing at, you know, 10, 20% a week in terms of its growth, it was really exponential. You know, then the real challenge was, uh, you know, how do we keep on top of the growth and maintain the service level because there were penalties that would be applied to us if, if we didn't maintain, wow. um, you know, a, a, a quick answer. Um, and, the, and the way it works is an interpreter comes up on, on, um, on a screen, uh, the deaf person has our technology in their home and it turns their TV into a, a, a video conferencing system. And then we have interpreters in interpreting centers that immediately come up and they take a call and they're calling for, you know, deaf uh, individuals to hearing individuals all over the, the wow. country. Wow. That's impressive. So there was a lot of uh, unknowns. Yeah. And uh, like every entrepreneur, you figure it out. Yeah. And you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to find good people. All of the things, uh, Bryce, that you know that go into making a successful company um, are needed in uh, a company that, that addresses a social problem and more. Well, I think the other thing that's interesting to me about the story of Sorensen Media is it, it wasn't for several years beyond that that you actually got into the kind of the formal impact investing. But really what you were doing even then was building a company that considered things beyond profit, um, you know, hiring your brother-in-law, uh, solving a problem at a scalable, with a scalable solution. But also, I think, also back to kind of lesson from your father, this, this idea of work and the value of work, the dignity of work. So talk to me a little bit about like your just perspective on work and what it means for people, uh, for families and for communities and why, why it's important that we, that we, um, we think about the dignity of work and the importance of work within our society. Well, I, I think it's core to um, the, um, the value that people see in themselves um, and in their communities um, that, you know, they have the independence, the self-reliance to be able to ultimately provide for themselves. And I think the solutions that impact investing brings to the markets or funds are, are oriented to, uh, you know, a hand up rather than a handout. And I think if, if people um, are given a choice, they'd much prefer to have a hand up mm. rather than simply a handout. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's part of this um, ultimately, you know, a, attaining um, self-reliance, self-control, uh, being able to uh, determine where you're going to go and not being reliant or controlled by others. Mm. And I think one of the other things I'm hearing you say as well is, I think uh, a, a desire of any person is to, to be seen and to be heard. And so the idea of a hand up versus a hand out is, is really an acknowledgement of the other person. And there's a, there's a personhood there uh, that's worth, uh, worth seeing, worth listening to. That's right. So that's really, that's really important. Uh, so you once said, um, so now shifting forward a little bit as you got into kind of uh, impact investing, you said, I now spend my days seeking, evaluating, and collaborating with others on ventures. And I've been surprised at finding great ideas in unexpected places, outside Silicon Valley, outside Wall Street, and even outside the private sector. So I wonder if you could take a moment and just kind of maybe expand that a little bit. Um, and if, if you would, maybe give me uh, maybe a story that's stuck in your mind of something that you've been personally impacted by as you've looked uh, beyond some of those more uh, typical places. Right. Well, I, I think I'll, I'll give an example that occurred. Uh, it was about the same time that I was involved with uh, Sorensen uh, Communications, maybe a little after. Uh, and it, it really was in um, my journey to... Uh, determine how I could give back and how I could do it in the most effective way. Um, and I became aware of an organization, and I, I, I liked microfinance because I saw, saw microfinance along the lines of uh, this, this philosophy of basically offering a hand up rather than a hand out. Um, and 
um, I became aware of, of the work that Unitas was doing in this space. And Unitas um, at that time was a nonprofit. And it had taken really a different approach with microfinance institutions. Um, rather than trying to uh, start one, uh, it took a venture capital approach in finding the very best ones that were existing. Uh, ones that um, you know knew the cultures and that were growing within the communities and then helping them to scale by providing additional capital, but also mentoring um, it, it could be best practices or, uh, you know, developing software or software support to help them to be able to, to build uh, their, their organizations. Now, at that time, most of the, uh, the MFIs were NGOs, um, and they found that their, their premise in doing this was starting to work, and these MFIs were starting to scale. And uh, I remember one MFI that when I funded through a grant um, that ultimately got deployed with them, they had about 20,000 clients, which seemed like a lot. And um, the Unitas folks had kind of run out of their donor capital and wanted to see how they could engage private capital to really help the growth uh, of this MFI. And so uh, the MFI uh, made the decision to convert to a for-profit entity and at that time started taking uh, on capital. And Unitas also organized uh, one of the very first venture funds, impact and venture funds, venture funds, um, Unitas uh, Equity Fund, mm -hmm. their first fund. It's now Elevar. And, of course, Elevar has raised several funds. But um, I invested in Elevar, or not Elevar, I mean Unitas Impact Fund. Um, and then I watched this particular MFI grow from, from 20,000 clients to 200,000 clients to ultimately oh. 6 million. Um, and, of course, being able to access capital to, to be able to do that. A powerful story, and then ultimately, uh, a very you know when when it ultimately sold or went public, uh, a great success story, a uh, great financial success story, yeah, and tremendous impact. So, um, again, another example. Now, I, at that time, impact investing had not been coined, um, and it was just more a way of thinking and and directing and you know, I guess you could call it venture philanthropy or or social philanthropy or social investing. Um, but um, I felt like this was really on to something. And if it could be implied in this sector, in this geography, and remember, this is in India. Uh, it's, it's not something that you go to Wall Street for. It's not something that you're going to find from a financial advisor. Um, and that's very much the way the world was back in then. I, and I determined that I needed to go out and look for entrepreneurs because they were the key to this yeah. in other parts of the world and um, look at opportunities to do this in other ways uh, to solve problems. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's uh, kind of leading to another quote. Um, you once said value driven investors like me who want their legacy to go beyond achieved returns on investment and who want to have had a positive impact on the world now have fewer excuses to sit on the sidelines and avoid or ignore some of the country's most glaring needs. We have a deep vested interest in helping alleviate societal challenges. So there's, there's kind of two questions I have with that. First is this, this idea of a value-driven investor like yourself. Could you speak to me a little bit about what are those values? What, what are the values that have informed the way you think about or the way you view the world and what you really are interested in kind of pressing into? Well, I think the values uh, really center around, um, you know, equal opportunity, um, equal um, um, access. Um, certainly equality is, uh, is a big part of that, that overall value chain as you look at the problems that are around the world. Um, I think helping people to be able to, to reach... Uh, dignity in, in, in their lives through 
uh, you know, self-reliance and self-determination. Um, I think certainly being able to address problems in society um, that may exist um, through the human condition, um, uh, you know, these are things that are the types of, of investable opportunities that I look forward to. That's great. And so then the second part of that question would be kind of twofold. First, uh, you didn't have to do this. I, you know, I, mean, I think it's worth saying, like, you you had grown a successful company. Uh, you had supported thousands of jobs. You had um, grown wealth and, you know, invested in the next generation through your family. You didn't have to do this uh, in the second season of your life. What what drove you to kind of really press into this? Um, and then why, uh, and I think it's provocative and I think a, a really good statement, but what, what does it say and, and how do we how do we get more people off the sidelines that, that really don't have an excuse to, uh, to see this? Well, I, th- I think that for me, um, I really did want to give back and I wanted to do it in the most impactful way that I could, the most uh, scalable and self-sustaining way. Um, so that desire has been there. And I, I believe that, frankly, people are inherently good and are looking for the way and the opportunity to be able to do this uh, in, in their own world and in their own context um, and are looking for examples and, and uh, various uh, ways to be able to contribute. I think that's the reason why the impact investing space is, is really growing so dramatically and I see it in the next generation even more profoundly than, um, you know, the, the, the growth that I've observed in the past. So, again, I think it's, it's part of, uh, of most people I, that there is a desire to want to, to do good. Um, and uh, there is really a need for great examples and... Um, uh, ways to be able to facilitate to yeah. make that happen. So uh, I love your hopefulness, uh, which is great because I, I share it. Um, but it is interesting with all the data that now shows uh, that they outperform, that socially conscious uh, portfolios or social entrepreneurs that are solving big problems outperform, that people of color or female founders are outperforming. Wh- what is What do you think is still a holdup? Uh, hang up for 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 more Main Street folks to to really embrace. What's the tipping point, and and how quickly do you think we're going to reach that? Yeah, well, I think there's some really great developments that have happened. Um, you know, we're here at a conference, and um, you know, two or three years ago, we just would not have had a director of impact for BlackRock. It's true that has seven trillion under management at a conference like this. We wouldn't have uh, the uh, the vice president over sustainability at at uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, we wouldn't have KKR with their their funds. So clearly, uh, getting more products, more intermediaries, um, the bigger institutions, uh, developing practices, uh, having the um, business roundtable. Now these are the biggest businesses of the world in their statement last year uh, in terms of the purposes of a business changed that from solely to the shareholder to now stakeholders. Um, Are there some other, that's a, that's an interesting, because I think, yeah, you're right. Over the last couple of years, there've been some, I think, seminal moments. Uh, And I think some people have discounted the, the business round table, uh, but the idea of getting, 180 plus CEOs to agree to language and to a common ethos of business is pretty, pretty profound. Are there some other moments that you think over the last couple of years that we can trace that have been really helpful in the trajectory that we see? I I think there's great signals. Uh, You know, you see, again, going back to BlackRock, Larry Fink, basically singularly pointing out sustainability and climate control, uh, these being core Mm -hmm. to uh, the directions for, Their, their future investing. Yeah. Um, you know, as you look at the growth of ESG and sustainable investing, 
to where you know it's estimated th- thirty trillion now um, under under management. Um, I think the same pathway um, is is there for impact investing. That's great. So um, I know you personally you do, you do do a lot of things, but one of the things you're also really, like really pressing into are opportunity zones. Uh, so I, I do want to kind of um, focus there a little bit. You you said once that uh, OZ, OZs have captivated you uh, because you saw a really powerful incentive that could motivate mainstream investors. Uh, people that normally wouldn't be looking at impact in their investment decisions could suddenly become impact investors. So talk to me about your work with with OZs. Um, and then I do want to get a little bit to some of the naysayers and the skeptics and, and how we might start to address uh, some of the criticism we're hearing. Sure. So I became aware of the legislation, um, you know, back when it was being uh, developed and, and support was being um, sought um, uh, in, in, in both chambers of, 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 the, of the legislature. And um, I did see it really as a moonshot policy because it was focused really on, on, I think, good data and a real need for investment in distressed communities. And we talked a little bit about this inequality or lack of opportunity. And I think a great example of that is really across the country where we see such a concentration of capital in really very small uh, pockets around the country. And uh, the Opportunity Zone legislation really has the promise to motivate investors to invest in distressed communities. Um, and I think um, our approach to that, and one of the reasons why I'm uh, involved in actually raising a fund and deploying my own capital, uh, and I am an impact investor, so you could understand this, but it really is to demonstrate that you can generate um, really measurable impact alongside market rate returns. And so we, we've taken a very uh, calculated approach in um, the, uh, the way that we uh, look for investable opportunities, um, both looking at what the needs are within these communities um, and um, then assessing the partners or developers that we may work with and what's being programmed to address those needs uh, and then being able to then make the investment and then measure over time uh, the results. Um, And I think the main areas that we look at are are primarily in the area of affordability. This could be housing. It could be food. um, It could be, um, you know, other basic uh, uh, necessities in life. Uh, we look at access to services that are needed because many of these uh, distressed areas um, are um, you know, deserts, as it might relate to health or, or food or, or whatever, um, that are needed for essential, uh, uh, you know, a, a thriving community. And then um, we look at economic development. I mean, ultimately, w- what can be programmed within the investment that can help to spur and 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 create jobs uh, and you know, create a, a sustainable community. Ultimately, what you want is a community that uh, is sustainable. It's not. It, this is an investment that's not a one-off investment, but because you're improving the neighborhood and the neighborhood is going to be around for a long time, it makes it a good investment. Yeah. So I, I think on some levels, what I'm hearing you say is. Uh, much like new market tax credits before or low income tax credits, um, the legislation is what it is, and it's really the the good actors and bad actors that that seek to implement that. Uh, and so you kind of stepping out and saying, "Hey, there's a there's a real opportunity to to really transform the way community is done and how we think about wealth creation in underinvested communities that have historically been um, discounted." Uh, and so what we need to do as impact investors is, is press into that. And uh, there are going to be bad use cases. Uh, and so how can we create a counter narrative that's positive, that seeks to engage with the communities and uh, to really have a good outcome that's sustainable into the long term? So uh, what, from your perspective, then, what do you think is going to be necessary 10 years from now? Because I think you've also said on OZs that this shouldn't be 
a one-off thing and that the goal should be this thing continues into the future. So what, what are the things that we should be watching over the next 10 years you think that uh, will help us determine whether or not this was good legislation that should have uh, staying power? Well, I think clearly um, you want to see good investment. You want to see, um, you know, a thoughtful deployment of capital that then over time uh, you measure the results um, and you can see the impact. I think ultimately that's what's going to be um, taken into account when this is uh, either going to be renewed or it's going to be discontinued. Is, did it work? Um, and, and I think that's a very intentional approach to investment. It's working with local communities and stakeholders within that community, identifying what the problems are, uh, coming up with a strategy for investment. And, and then this, this capital is rewarded for being, you know, place-based and patient over time yeah. to uh, enable the transformation to take place. And I think ultimately it's ecosystems that are going to be built or needed within these communities for sustainable. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things that I've heard from communities is you know, to do really good stakeholder engagement. It takes time and intentionality. But with this legislation, it came on with such a force and at such a speed that it kind of took people off guard. How do, how do we help some of the skeptics uh, understand the, the process um, and the need? And, and have you seen good examples of stakeholder engagement at the community level to make sure that neighborhoods and neighbors and council members uh, really understand or are a part of, of the strategies that are being developed? Yeah, first of all, I, I have seen that. Good. And I think um, we need to make and create awareness of, of these uh, uh, really good um, use cases out there. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons behind the, um, the Opportunity Zone Challenge uh, that we have through the Sorensen Impact Center with, with Forbes. It really is to um, highlight uh, the best practices, uh, both at the community level and at the fund level, what's working, and um, then be able to essentially, you know, make uh, that known to the rest of the space. Um, and I think there are some really good examples that have uh, developed out there, communities that have come together and been very proactive, identifying what their problems are, bringing the stakeholders together, uh, preparing and marketing their prospectuses of what they have, um, and, and really being able to attract capital and have it deployed. And I think more and more of that um, and, uh, you know, successful uh, pro promulgation of what is working out there will uh, really have a very catalytic effect in, in bringing others on board to do the same. 